And those things are certainly the drivers of Maine's future. Um, so um, I'd like to start out with this quote that I've used for many years now from Sir Nicholas Stern, the former British exchequer and the economist who wrote the so-called Stern Report on the economics of climate change. Uh, he says, climate change is the greatest market failure in history. I think that's an understatement. Uh, we've externalized the climate from our uh, economy, and uh, accordingly, we are going to have to deal with that externality, and uh, those, that day of reckoning has arrived. So really what I'd like to do is draw the connection between education, economy, and building the sustainability in Maine. Uh, I am an educator and uh, a researcher, so I will have some emphasis on education, which I think is, is key to the other components. Uh, I could show you a lot of graphs of increasing temperature. Everybody in this room is probably familiar with the increasing temperature that has been occurring since 1950. Uh, that's the period of time that we think is, is most germane. But in fact, uh, the one that I want to show you is one that was created by a so-called climate change skeptic, uh, Richard Muller at, at Berkeley, who uh, was rather noisy in his skepticism of climate change. And uh, so the Koch brothers gave him uh, some millions of dollars to do a reanalysis of the same data that NOAA, NASA, the UK Hadley Center, the European Space Agency had already analyzed and come to this conclusion. Well, sure enough, the science will out, and he found exactly the same thing. Uh, with great fanfare announced that human activity accounts for almost all of the increase since this early period. The error bars are much larger back here when our instrumentation was cruder. Uh, 2000 to 2013 was the hottest period on record. And if you were born after April 1985, you've not experienced a globally cooler than average month. Quite a statement, especially for the current generation in college. There's no doubt that our present emissions trajectory is utterly catastrophic. Uh, the, the data that had come out of uh, the last two assessment reports from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put us at 5 degrees centigrade or around 9 degrees Fahrenheit average by the end of the century. The fifth assessment downgraded it just a tad and said the average was 4.5. The reality is we're going to be anywhere between 3 and 6 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. Those numbers are incompatible with civilization as we know it. The top two red lines here represent two different emission scenarios, and the, the, the bar on the right there is temperature in Fahrenheit. So you can see we're up around 10, 11 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's look at where we stand in history just to get this straight. Uh, if you were to go back 20,000 years, and we can, of course, go back many, many thousands of years before that, but let's just look at the current era beginning with the end of the last glaciation. You can see that the planet began to warm. That warming was not due to us, obviously. It was due to the orbital forcing of the temperature of the planet or the position of the Earth in space relative to the sun. And as it warmed up, uh, it started to produce, the planet started to naturally produce greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, which augmented the warming. And we reached a maximum about the time that agriculture was getting off to full steam, that we were starting to grow our crops uh, on a large scale. And then we started to cool down again. And the reason we were cooling, again, was because of that orbital forcing. The planet was moving into a position relative to the sun that the planet was naturally cooling. We were not doing anything to cool the planet. And then something remarkable happened on the way to the 20th century, and that was the Industrial Revolution. And you can see that the, the temperature record is now exponential, uh, relatively small range, but still it's an exponential gain. Uh, it's abrupt, it's sudden, it's unlike anything in the history of the planet. It's absolutely stunning in terms of how fast it's occurred. And this is all driven by the greenhouse gases that are being generated from the Industrial Revolution. The question is, uh, what we do now determines the outcome for later. So we can talk about adaptation uh, a lot today, and we will. Adaptation is obviously very important. We can adapt to a higher temperature regime on the planet, but we've got to stop the train. So mitigation is absolutely essential because there is no adaptation that will suffice for 5 degrees centigrade. That will not work. So we're going to have to stop the train. So mitigation and adaptation have to go hand in hand. So we can all, one of the questions that's always asked is when will climate disruption be widespread? 
A remarkable paper appeared in Nature in October, and it asked the question based on empirical data, when can we expect the range of temperatures to depart from what we have experienced since around 1860? You can see here's the range of temperatures that we've experienced. Uh, the first 11 years out were pretty much above this, this line, and they take a point out in the Atlantic representative of the entire planet. You can do a point for any place in their data, uh, any place on Earth. Maine, it turns out, is very close to this average. Uh, unprecedented climate will begin about 2047. There's a, no doubt in my mind that this will lead to a billion dollar uh, adaptation industry. There's no doubt that we're going to have to respond to this. So 2047 is for all intents and purposes tomorrow. That's right around the corner. Here's what I think is the most compelling issue that we need to be focused on, and that's what I call the overlooked ecological imperative. Uh, the climate zones are moving faster than many organisms can migrate or adapt, and you can see that this is the, the zone shifts from the USDA over this 15-year period of 1990 to 20, 2006. We're seeing a similar pattern in, in, our, in our oceans, especially in the offshore waters. This is the Gulf of Maine surface and bottom. We're at 150-year record high ocean temperatures in the Gulf of Maine. And we've heard a lot in the news recently about the impact of that on the lobster fisheries and other fisheries. We know that, that species are appearing in the Gulf of Maine that have never been there historically. They're coming up from further south. Remarkable uh, observations suggesting that maybe we need to be thinking about adapting our fisheries. So there's new reality for what I'm calling the environmental century. Climate change will define this century, and, and I think it's appropriate to call it the environmental century. First, the rate of ecological change is orders of magnitude more rapid than any in the last 65 million years. This, this statement comes from a remarkable paper that appeared in Science late last year. And there can be little doubt that agriculture, forestry, wildlife, fisheries are increasingly impacted, and they're going to require new management strategies. When I went to wildlife school as an undergraduate, I went to a great program. And they taught me that basically sophisticated management was to build a preserve, put up a sign. If you were really sophisticated, you built a habitat connector to an adjacent preserve someplace else so you could maintain the populations that were in both preserves. And that would suffice. Well, now we know that will not suffice because the, the growing zones, the climate zones for those organis organisms are literally moving out from over those locations. So we've got a serious problem that we have to address and this will require considerably more sophistication in our thinking. One of the things that the University of Maine Climate uh, Change Institute has, has pioneered is the understanding of how compressed the climate zones are in Maine. Here you see essentially three, almost four climate zones that are compressed uh, in a very uh, limited space in Maine because of our geography, our relationship to the ocean. Uh, it's even more remarkable when you compare us to northern Europe. Uh, all, over 20 degrees north la of latitude are compressed into less than 4.5 degrees latitude. The potential for rapid change in Maine is profound. Uh, it hasn't yet been documented. I believe that it's there. So here are some realities of the ecology and economics of the environmental century. We can only burn about 20% of the known conventional fossil fuel reserves. We're not talking about tar sands. We're talking about conventional fossil fuel reserves to keep warming below this putative guardrail of 2 degrees centigrade. So we obviously have to begin a rapid transition to alternative energy. Some degree of dangerous climate disruption is unavoidable. It's already in the pipeline. It's coming at the current generation in college. That drives my ethics as an educator. It drives my agenda as an educator. The pace of ecological change is accelerating. Will Stefan, the, the biologist from Australia, has called this the great acceleration. I, I think that's accurate. It, it's fitting. It fits with what I've seen over the 30 years of my career. And we know that it's at least an order of magnitude faster than it's been in 65 million years. Many species will acclimate or migrate in ways that we cannot now predict. Uh, some will occupy novel ecological niches, and there will be novel ecosystems that have never existed before, at least within uh, recent uh, biological history. 
one of the most important things that we have to acknowledge is that much will be lost. We, as I say, as said before, we've got to take that monster out from under the bed and look it in the eye. We're going to lose some things. How much and what we lose depends on what we do now. We are out of time. We need to act. Adaptation in food production and civil engineering have to begin immediately. If you know what kind of crops you want to be growing in sustainable uh, agriculture in Maine in 2050, you need to be planning for those crops today. If you, know it, if you know what kind of forest you want in the North Woods, what kind of species composition you want in those North Woods in 2070, you need to be planning for that today. You need to be making some decisions as to how to manage those forests. Civil engineering is especially crucial. Any place a road crosses water within 100 miles of the coast is a prime target for re-engineering. We need to be looking at that. We need to ask the question, where is the resources going to come to do that re-engineering? The one point to make here in the terms of the cost equation is that the cost of reactive adaptation later is much higher than the cost of mitigation and proactive adaptation today. So we've got a window of opportunity that is rapidly closing, um, and we need to act on it. So obviously, we, we're really talking about sustainability. And I like this diagram from Oxfam, from Kate Wariworth. This is, uh, she has a social foundation here that's determined by our access to food, water, income, education, energy jobs, social equity, gender equity, and health. And then there's this space that we can operate in within. And then there's this environmental ceiling that is determined by things like climate change, <coughs> land use change, biodiversity loss, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen cycles. We know we've exceeded this ceiling in climate change. We know we've exceeded it dramatically in terms of biodiversity loss. And we are rapidly exceeding it in terms of the, the reactive nitrogen and phosphorus that we're putting into the environment. I have a simple message as an educator. Sustainability has to be the mission of education. It's not one of the missions. It needs to be integrated across the entire curriculum. Now, think about it for a minute. We don't have any problem talking about instituting writing across the curriculum because that's one of those core literacy things that we think every college student needs to know. So we're going to write. We're going to teach writing in every course that we have, essentially. We're going to teach it across the curriculum. Well, I would suggest to you the time has come to make teaching sustainability across the curriculum a prime, uh, a prime directive for higher education. And it should be the mission of the economy, because otherwise we've externalized all of this. So here's, here's the imperative of sustainability. Failure to implement sustainable practices will result in catastrophic consequences for our species and for many others, and these will mostly be irreversible for a thousand years or more. We know this with respect to climate change because of the way CO2 emissions have dissipated in paleoclimates from they were caused by natural sources. And we know how long it takes for them to dissipate and how long it takes for the temperature of the planet to return to normal. We can model that in, in current, uh, with current modeling techniques. And we know that a thousand years out, the planet is still substantially warmer than it was before we began this rise. So irreversible effectively on any human time scale. So we have an ethical obligation to prepare our youth for this challenge. This is an ethical obligation that history will hold us accountable for. I believe that it's urgent that we produce leading edge practitioners that can integrate knowledge from multiple disciplines and understand the trade-offs among possible solutions. So it's this integration that I care the most about I know that in-depth understanding within a discipline is important. I don't think we're going to lose that. But I would submit to you that at least as rigorous and challenging as that is, is this integration. For the first time in history, our students have access to all knowledge. Effectively, they have access to all knowledge. When I took the comprehensive exam for my PhD, I walked into a room of a bunch of professors around a table, and some of them had uh, had famous reputations, big reputations, and I was expected to have it all up here. That is not a realistic expectation today. But what we really should be training our students in is information literacy, how to access information, how to judge its quality, how to apply it in a problem-solving context. Well, that's called sustainability science. 
Sustainability science is education and research that seeks to understand the complexity of the interactions among economy, society, and nature to propose concrete solutions. It really is tools for mitigation, adaptation, and building resilient societies, resilient ecosystems, those, those complex systems that can resist strong perturbation and bounce back. We know that this field, in terms of the number of authors and papers that have been produced, has been exploding. It's only relatively recently unified. The Proceedings of the National Academy has set aside a section of the journal called uh, Sustainability Science and endorsed by the National Academy, the National Science Foundation, and the AAAS. And here's how it works. I spent my career building these interdisciplinary programs where we get a bunch of experts around a table to work on a problem and maybe three or four weeks later we have defined the word model. Follow me? In other words, each discipline brings its own myopic perspective to that problem solving process. And it's important that each individual have some integration across disciplines. The transdisciplinary process takes the student and puts them at the center of the problem solving process, teaches them the sophisticated process of how to acquire the information, assess its value, and apply it in a problem solving context. So the various disciplines are integrated through the problem solving process and focused on solutions to real, real world problems. It's a method for how we teach, a new way of knowledge delivery, for training students as knowledge consumers and faculties as knowledge managers. Uh, it's experiential, participatory, problem-based, and solution-focused, and it's integrated and built on, uh, integrated with and built on the humanities and the social sciences. So here are some tools that we're using at Unity College. We frame undergraduate research as transdisciplinary intrinsically. Faculty have to lead this charge. If the faculty are not engaged, it's not going to work because the, the faculty are the key to the success of this process. We are highly experiential. We have a long tradition of that. This pre-adapts us for sustainability science. Imagine if students were given real-world problems brought to them by municipalities, by agencies, by government to solve in the classroom and in the field. I dare say we might have more solutions than we currently have. We use online content. We argue that we should flip the classroom, save the classroom for those experiential, that experiential engagement. Go get the information where it resides. Our job is to certify knowledge, not necessarily to deliver it. Uh, we teach finance and management as a core skill. We're, we're building that programming. Uh, we believe that institutional operational sustainability, such as our solar panels, our, uh, our sustainable farming, our, our new uh, half moon field station, all of those sorts of things need to be integrated into the curriculum. And finally, we've got to kill the silos. These independent uh, autonomous budgets within the universities are the biggest impediment to this kind of integration. Now, one of the things we can do is, is we can take sustainability from not just operational sustainability, but we can also bring it to the curriculum through sustainability science. We can also bring it to administration through divestment. How are we using our money? Uh, colleges and universities have large funds that they, they invest, some larger than others. I wish ours were larger. Uh, right now we're at about $15 million in terms of our endowment. But in November 2012, the Unity College Board of Trustees one of the proud, proudest moments in my, my entire career was to be on that conference call when the entire board voted unanimously to divest our endowment from investing in the top 200 fossil fuel companies. Thank you. Thank you. I can thank uh, some of the John Newland, one of the board members from uh, Unity College, standing over here in the corner, also a uh, member of the, the climate table. So uh, one of the things we know about divestment is that the fossil-free uh, portfolio and the fossil-free portfolio with opportunities of, of new alternative energies compared to the Morgan Stanley Cumulative Index differ very, very little. There is almost no penalty associated <coughs> with divestment. Now, it's been argued that fossil, fossil fuels are 14 plus percent of the, the stock exchange. Big deal. That means that there's 86 percent of the stock exchange that you can work with, that you don't have to be focused on. So divestment in fossil fuels does not significantly impact returns from a diversified portfolio. I believe it boils down to willingness. Are you willing to make the effort to do this? 
So we know that education is in crisis. We've got a high cost of education. You heard about it again on, on main public broadcasting this morning, driving in. The impact of the online degrees, impact of for-profit institutions. A lot of students have to work full-time now while going to college. It, I know firsthand how much it costs to deliver face-to-face -face programming with bricks and mortar. The students show declining competency and literacy in many areas. Uh, there are a number of studies that show this as really alarming. So I'm going to make an assertion. I'm going to suggest to you that education programming and sustainability is essential for the salvation of our species and for the future of higher education. The two things go hand in hand. It really is different this time. We're closing departments, not at Unity, but at, at, in general in higher education. We're closing departments. We're laying off faculty. The number of liberal arts institutions has declined almost 40% over the last 20 years. We have to clarify the value proposition. Why do you go to college? And what happens there that is valuable for your future? And how does it relate to the most relevant things of the future? Well, the value proposition is simple. There can be no higher value proposition. If you know of one, tell me I'm all ears than defining student, than offering students the effective means to address the sustainability imperatives of the coming decades. This is their future. There can be no higher value proposition. I'm going to also claim that if we do this, employment will not be an issue. Students who are, have transdisciplinary skills framed by sustainability science supported by the humanities will do just fine. And here's where I think they're going to do just fine. First of all, let's look at where we, where we sit in the state of Maine. We've got a declining young population. Uh, Maine birth rate's been declining since 1990. As of the 2010 census, Maine was the oldest population with a median age of 42.7. Maine has the third highest old age dependency per 100 working adults. Florida and West Virginia are only slightly higher, so the three of us are, are right there together. Maine has been a declining market in several economic sectors and has recovered from the Great Recession about three years behind the rest of the United States, much more slowly. So how can we reinvigorate Maine's economy? Well, I think the answer for education is also the answer to this. So here's what our mix of fossil fuels is today and alternative energy, very minor hydro and alternative energies. The Rocky Mountain Institute seems to think that we can get to here, where we have a much stronger reliance on wind, solar, and other renewables. There's work being done at Berkeley that suggests, or Stanford rather, that suggests that we can be completely independent from fossil fuels by 2050 if we are aggressive. Bottom line is there are several feasible scenarios to get from here to something like this, and this equals jobs. This means new jobs. This means new employment, diversification of the economy. This is the McKinsey Climate Mitigation Cost Analysis. Above the zero line means it costs money. These are in euros. Below the zero line means that we make money by doing each of these things. And you can see that, that a lot of these things are no-brainers. Electricity improvements, electricity from landfill gas, cropland nutrient management. These things make us money. We should be doing it anyway. Waste recycling, cars going full hybrid, tillage and residue management, all of those things make sense. Uh, notice that the most expensive items and the ones that have some of the least impact are carbon capture and sequestration from existing power plants. They're going to be very expensive, but if we look at where the European carbon market begins, it's clear that it encompasses most of this chart. My, my point here is that mitigation costs which will be now, if we act now, somewhere in the range of 2% of the world gross domestic product can be absorbed by existing economies producing new jobs. So every one of these represents new jobs. Adaptation of agriculture to climate disruption is clearly imperative. Uh, NASA and the USDA are de developing crop models based on climate scenarios for dealing with this, this clearly is going to result in new jobs, especially in Maine where we have small-scale agriculture. Climate mitigation and adaptation in the built environment are crucial. Right now there's 16 trillion dollars in the replacement value of all U.S. homes. The gross domestic product of the U.S. is about 15.5 trillion dollars. Uh, in Maine the average replacement value of a home is 203,000. Uh, this represents an incredible target for industry and for jobs, jobs creation. Solar hot water, 
solar photovoltaic. Solar PV can generate 56% of Maine's peak power needs. The Sewell Company and Revision Energy came up with that number. I find it very credible. Uh, geothermal uh, works on certain scales in Maine. It's something that we need to be looking into. Sustainable pellet heating, the emphasis on sustainable there is, is truly important. But this is definitely a biofuel that's viable. At Unity College, we have the, the Terra House, which is a passive house design and retro. We could retrofit houses to emulate this design. The first year we had this residence hall open, it cost us $83 for the entire winter to heat it. And it gives you an idea of how efficient that is. Efficiency is the low hanging fruit. All of these efficiency retrofits, all of this represents new opportunity diversification for the economy. We know that biological communities are being dramatically impacted. Maine is natural resources. That's what this state is all about in one form or another. It's about natural resources. You can see the state of New Hampshire migrating in terms of its climate under the current emissions scenario down to the border between North Carolina and uh, Virginia. And this is the present day habitat suitability. Look at how diverse the, the species of trees are. Uh, along the eastern seaboard and look at what the habitat suitability will become by the end of the century. In other words, generalist species that have a wide tolerance for, for temperatures will occupy the dominant, they will, they will dominate the landscape. We need to be thinking about this. We can change this scenario. There's plenty of room for adaptation here. The point is, in Maine in particular, where we're all about natural resources, this amounts to jobs, new employment opportunities. Conservation in the environmental century. Here is a, just a few titles that I pulled out of my own, my own literature base. Managed relocation as an adaptation strategy. Climate change and moving species. Is assisted colonization ethical? I would suggest to you we, you, we have no choice, uh, so we need to resolve that issue. Vulnerability of cloud forest reserves in Mexico, et cetera. All of these strategies, managing this equals jobs. So. One of the ways to incentivize this and to build it into the economy is through offsets and carbon credits. Uh, this, this is a beautiful graph that comes from a program that is now defunct at Maine Housing, uh, where you have emissions reductions and emissions re renewal removals as different types of carbon offsets. And basically, you use that money, you sell those offsets and use that money to generate the revenues so that you can do that retrofit of the built environment of Maine. And you can pay for uh, the natural resource management that needs to be done. So I believe that sustainability will diversify our economy. The Brookings Institute in 2011 produced a study that showed that the clean economy, defined very conservatively, is the third largest of these big sectors. And if you look at what happened in that clean economy during the recession, you see that the uh, uh, economy as a whole lost jobs, but the clean economy with and without the public subsidy just smiled and kept on growing. So there's, there's clearly enormous energy and activity in this sector. You would have trouble buying it on the stock market. It's not publicly traded. It's largely private right now. Uh, those days are rapidly coming to an end. So can we have a different future for Maine? We've got a number of challenges. We have an inverted demography, slow economic recovery, Cultural sectors that view in migration as undesirable, a weak manufacturing base and low salaries, inadequate and deteriorating infrastructure, bridges, roads, and hydro, rapidly shifting climate zones and ecology, and a mistaken belief <coughs> that the impact of climate change will not be so severe as to not be manageable, that we'll be able to manage this somehow. That is not true by the end of the century. But we have many advantages. We've got abundant fresh water that is unlikely to run out. We have existing functional infrastructure and market process for marine fisheries. We need to adapt that. Forests are in large single owner parcels. This provides strong financial incentive for adaptive management, and it provides an organizational structure for adaptive management. We've got abundant raw material for sustainably produced and managed biofuels. We have a large number of land trusts. In fact, I've never been any place that had so many land trusts. It's astonishing. What this means is that there is established legal access and precedent for conservation levers. You can actually, you already have in place access for conservation. 
these land trusts need to start coordinating. They need to be talking to one another because uh, those land trusts do not exist in isolation. <coughs> we have a growing agricultural sector for young, sustainable farmers. It's one of the few sectors of the economy that's growing. We've got an excellent system of higher education and community colleges. We have a world-renowned climate change institute at UMaine. So here are some suggestions. Make climate mitigation and adaptation planning and implementation the top priority for all state agencies. Provide strong economic incentives, for example, low interest loans for private business to develop in the fields of mitigation and adaptation in Maine. Structure taxes to reduce the tax burden on young people who settle in Maine, especially those in sustainable agriculture. Provide property tax exemption for alternative or renewable energy systems. Reduce tax burden on careers in sustainability. Provide tax relief for Maine businesses that export sustainability services to exterior markets and bring that money back home. Evolve current homestead property exemption to include energy conservation tax exemptions. Additional suggestions. Provide debt relief for students who choose to stay in Maine after graduation regardless of their state of origin. <coughs> Uh, coordinate education to make Maine the best place in the world to learn sustainability. Get these different excellent educational institutions on the same page. Implement clean energy incentives. A public, public utility should allow me to sell my excess electrons from my net zero home back to the grid and they should pay me a fair rate for that. We should implement, implement widespread. There are many communities in Maine that have it already but it needs to be uh, permeated throughout the entire state, the property assessed clean energy or PACE financing and tax exemptions. Uh, loan institutions can build energy savings into the mortgages, allowing those energy savings to be realized right up front uh, by, the, by the homeowner, and insurance companies could offer discounts for energy efficiency. These are just a few things that, that come to mind as, as uh, low-hanging fruit. So. Um, I just turned 60, sad to say, or actually I'm really happy to say that, when I come to think of it. Uh, when I was in uh, high school in the late 1960s, I honestly believed I'd have a flying car. Like, I want to know where that sucker is, but we don't have it. Uh, one of the things that we always teach in, in ecology is the, the story of Easter Island. This is a civilization that, that went into demise and decline and eventually completely extinct because of its overuse of its resources. There's great mystery here as to what actually happened there, but the remains are not pretty. It suggests that ecology was the driving factor. Is this our fate? Is this where we're headed as a planet? I actually don't think so. Uh, I think more realistic alternatives are right there in front of us right now. This is modern day Mumbai. Uh, I was just there last February. It's uh, unhealthy, dangerous, extremely crowded, a difficult place to live, very challenging with shortened lifespan. This is what we could have. I sincerely believe we can have.